place around here. There's no hiding place around here. Yeah, look to the rock at my face. A rock cries out, no hiding place, no hiding place around here. Yeah, the devil, he wears hypocrite shoes. Yeah, the devil, he wears hypocrite shoes. Yeah, the devil wears hypocrite shoes. You don't watch out, he'll slip on you. No hiding place around here. Yeah, there's no hiding place around here. There's no hiding place around here. Yeah, look to the rock, at my face. The rock cries out, no hiding place, no hiding place around here. Gonna pitch my tent in the old campground. Gonna pitch my tent in the old campground. Gonna pitch my tent in the old campground. Give it old scratch one more round. No hiding place round here. Yeah, there's no hiding place round here. Yeah, there's no hiding place round here. Yeah, look to the rock, hide my face. The rock cries out, no hiding place, no hiding place round here. Yeah. Woo! Woo woo! <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mad Mets. Yes, um, yes, yes. Welcome, everybody, to History on Tap. Um, this, you may have guessed, our topic tonight is about music, song, a little bit of dance, um, all in our area. Uh, my name is Henry Paquette. I'm with the Mosby Heritage Area Association. We are joined, as always, by Travis Shaw, also the Mosby Heritage Area Association, and also by Joe Rizzo, the director of the Loudoun Museum. Um, tonight, we have three very special guests. Um, of course, we want to tap in some experts for our discussion about music and song and dance, and so we have three of our area's uh, most favorite local musicians. We have Mr. Matt Metz, with wearing headphones there, who um, brought us in on a song he'll tell us about in just a second. We also have Bess Putnam, who's here, a vocalist by trade, but she also plays more than her fair share of instruments, I think. Um, and also Mr. Jamie Potter of the Crooked Angels is with us here tonight. Um, so we're gonna go through many different stories about music and song. Um, and we're also going to tell you about the local beer that we're drinking per usual. Um, so Matt, why don't you tell us about the song um, that you just played for us here, and then what you're going to tell us a little about tonight as a quick preview. So that tune is the Carter family tune. That is an old, old song. Um, a lot of biblical references in there. Carter family are the first family of country music. They're from um, Bristol, Virginia. Um, they provided the um, kind of the template for how country music was going to develop. And I mean, also at the same time, kind of provided the template for how uh, kind of pop music and recorded music was going to develop. So they were not only songwriters, but song um, collectors. They kind of knew everything about the, they were like the beginning of the tradition. They were the kind of end of, as I'm going to talk about later, the end of music being handed down um, family and tradition wise um, from generation to generation and the beginning of people being able to hear um, those traditional musics that um, that America ended up becoming obsessed with and not just in the, in like the places that it came from. Awesome. awesome. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, I'm going to later talk about um, Ralph Stanley. Um, and I'm going to talk about his early, kind of how he got started, a couple um, experiences I had with him. And I'm going to talk about um, one of his two banjo styles and I'll play a couple tunes um, from him. Great. Great. Thank you, Matt. Um, Joe, why don't you tell us a little about your topic tonight? So I'm going to talk about uh, a song that really changes American politics and really, in a lot of ways, American cultures. Uh, I'm going to talk about the song Tip and Tie, uh, which became popularized during the presidential campaign of 1840. Great. And what are you drinking? I am drinking Funky Face from Old Ox Brewery here in Loudoun County. Uh, first time having it, and I'd say it is pretty good, especially if you like sours. Awesome. 
Um, I'll be talking tonight about Billy Pierce, who was a choreographer, um, a big part of the Harlem Renaissance, and it just so happened that he was born in Purcellville, Virginia, um, and had a big impact on national culture, both in dance and with some song as well. And tonight I am drinking Lost Rhino's Final Glide. It's a Hefeweizen, very tasty, a nice summery kind of a beer, even on this like very dreary we're having wishful thinking i know i'm <laughs> just dreaming wishful drinking wishful drinking that's a band name i didn't come that up with that I, I had heard it <laughs> um and then travis what are you talking about tonight so i'm going to be talking about um kind of the country music scene in washington dc and in northern virginia um in the 1950s you know we always think of nashville or maybe austin you know, as as the epicenter of country, but for a while there, DC and and the surrounding areas were very very important to the national story of country music. So, I'm going to be talking about that. Um, since we're talking about music tonight, I'm drinking Positive Mental Attitude from Keith. Oh, sweet. Um, Bad Brains. You know, the the logo and the name are obviously an, an homage to Bad Brains, the legendary DC hardcore band, one of my favorites. So, awesome. and the beer is not bad either. So. <laughs> Yes, yes. And Bess, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be chiming in with today. I'm going to talk about Patsy Cline. I'm going to talk about her influence over the business um, of music and then what made her a legend, what set her apart. Great, great. And then Jamie? Um, I'm going to be talking about one of my uh, Appalachian heroes, uh, Ricky Skaggs. Um, so I was born in Virginia in one of uh, George Washington's old farmhouses. My dad's side of the family is actually Kentucky and Tennessee. And so I feel uh, excited to bring a little bit of that, um, that, that side to the story. Great, great. Well, um, per usual, we're going to try and keep this in a quasi chronological scope. Um, and please comment with what you're drinking tonight. Let us know where you are listening in from and keep the questions coming. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people that want to pick our guest brains tonight a little bit. Yeah, if you have requests, let us know. So. Yeah, if you have requests, I know for a fact that Travis Shaw is learning the banjo, so. I yeah. just started last week, so I will not be playing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Then um, Joe is our earliest bookend. Why don't you kick us off? Yeah, I figured I would talk about uh, something in the 19th century and a song that had huge ramifications on a lot of aspects of American life. But it's a song that was so relevant and popular then, it still has implications now. Uh, anyone who's a Parks and Recreation fan might recall the episode where they're trying to save uh, Parks of Pawnee and they go to that museum that's got that massive ball that was rolled that's not made up for Parks and Rec. They really did that wow. during the campaign. And they played the song Tip and Tie, again, for Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. Uh, they Might Be Giants also did a cover of the song. So, I mean, it's still very much known today, which I think speaks to how important that song was. Uh, but the song is about uh, William Henry Harrison, who is a Virginian, who was the presidential nominee of the Whig Party in 1840, and his vice president, John Tyler, also of Virginia. Uh, Tippy Canoe comes from William Henry Harrison becoming known as the hero of Tippy Canoe, mm -hmm. uh, a previous battle in Indian Wars. Uh, so that's how the song really starts to originate. And the lyrics are fascinating of the song. Uh, once they're created because they reveal a lot of aspects of American culture, but also what a lot of people strive to be. Uh, mm -hmm. So not only do they attack the opponent in this case, which was Democratic uh, current president Martin Van Buren, uh, but they also show the qualities that people wanted to possess, uh, in particular masculinity and valor. And that's what the, the lyrics really epitomize. And it all started, and the kind of revolution in politics started from a quote from a Baltimore pro-Democrat newspaper which they thought was making a, a, you know, a strong case for their person and thought they were saying something negative about William Henry Harrison. And they recited a quote that someone else gave saying, quote, give him a barrel of hard cider and settle a pension of $2,000 a year on him. And my word for it, he will sit the remainder of his days in a log cabin. So what they're basically doing is attacking William Henry Harrison. They're saying, this is an old man. He's 67 at the time, older than any president could have been so far at that point. Give this guy a pension, put him out to pasture. He'll just sip on hard cider in, in the cabin. Can we volunteer for that, though? Yeah. <laughs> Being given a barrel of cider oh, and a pension? It doesn't <laughs> sound like a log cabin. And a log cabin. It's a good yeah, deal. They hoped he would think the same thing, that this was a guy who had not really involved much in national politics, 
just a, an old general that they're trotting out to try to win an election from the Democrats who have held it for three terms. Uh, but it has the complete opposite effect. And the Whigs become very uh, apt at capitalizing on slogans and people's feelings. And they run with this idea of log cabin and hard cider. They start to paint William Henry Harrison as like the common man, that he is just a guy out there chopping wood by his cabin, drinking cider, uh, philanthropic. Uh, when duty calls, he protected the country. Um, and William Henry Harrison capitalizes on as well, changes his outfits, uh, has much more common appeal to it. And then they start painting Martin Van Buren as this complete aristocrat dandy who has no idea what Americans are going through. Of course, mm. perceptions more reality. The reality is Martin Van Buren had a very humble upbringing in New York. William Henry Harrison's from an aristocratic Virginia family. Uh, but that's irrelevant to this because the way in which they portray him <laughs> was that this is just a common man. The lyrics of the song Tip and Tie try to capitalize on log cabin and hard cider and that common man theme. Uh, one of the first verses of it says, let them talk about hard cider and log cabins too. And it will only help speed the ball for Tippy Canoe and Tyler too. And of course that ball is a literal ball, a large ball that they would roll from city to city to rally to rally uh, made of hide that they would push around uh, for these massive rallies that would start taking off in cities in support of William Henry Harrison. And not just the ball and not just the song. Uh, again, the song is uh, called Tip and Tie. It's written by uh, Alexander Kaufman uh, Ross from Ohio. Uh, it's based off the Little Pig's minstrelsy tune. Uh, and again, they wanted to really capitalize on how people fell in 1840. And you see log cabins and hard cider sediments everywhere. Uh, social clubs form around these phrases. People start wearing buttons, apparel, uh, anything they can get their hands on that have iconic images of this campaign for William Henry Harrison. And they not just try to, again, paint Harrison as this common man, but they really try to attack Martin Van Buren as well in the song. Uh, for example, one of the lyrics says, and with them will beat little Van. Van is a used up man, and with them will beat little Van. Now, Little Van is a very orchestrated attack as they are trying to attack how short Martin Van Buren is. Uh, so not only trying to paint him as they would call an aristocratic dandy, they also wanted to make fun of his lack of height. He's also short. See, the biggest that, insult, yeah. Low See, energy, right? low energy. Yeah. <laughs> um, but effective and still uh, relevant for current mm -hmm. politics, attacks like that. Uh, so he's often referred to as Little Maddie and Little Van. Nice, nice. In addition to that little, that large ball, their roll, people would eat up this song. Uh, and it really resonated with people. And one of the reasons why they were so attracted to this song was because of the panic of 1837, which put a lot of economic hardship on common Americans. So when they start to now think that the Whig party is hearing them and resonating with them and can do something to help their plight, that really sets off this class warfare between elitists as they painted the Van Buren types and then the more common Americans as the Whigs are trying to capitalize. But it's not just men who are buying in to this new kind of frenzy of politics. Uh, it brings in all sorts of people and women get very involved in American politics in 1840 as well. And even though they by and large can't vote Wigs still target women to come to campaigns, to wear paraphernalia, to get their husbands to also wear things and to go to rallies. And they really target women in this pitch to get a large voter turnout. And you get some pushback locally from that, as a lot of people don't like that women are getting more involved in politics and speaking their mind. Uh, for example, there's a Democratic politician who during a debate in Loudoun County uh, voices displeasure at the women of Loudoun for doing so. Uh, what he said in this speech, quote, this is what a newspaper said about him, that he, quote, assailed the ladies for attending political meetings and for giving their smiles to the Whigs. I'll cheers to the ladies of Loudoun who are smiling for the Whigs in 1840. <laughs> He's seen that as a negative. The ladies. And all this, to recap, just does have a dramatic effect actually on generating the vote. 
1840 is unmatched in terms of voter participation uh, in this Harrison versus Martin Van Buren election. Uh, for example, it overwhelmingly favors William Henry Harrison when people do come vote. He wins 19 out of 26 states. Uh, he also trounces Van Buren in the Electoral College vote. But it stands out more to me than anything were the amount of people who are eligible to vote who do. Mm. In 1836, 57.8% of the vote actually vote. So that's even much more than we get today. I mean, we can't crack 50% anymore. Um, so it's still higher than now turnout in 1836. In 1840, the turnout was 80.2% of eligible voters. So I mean, it's shocking the amount. And three-fifths of the new voters, which were a significant group of people in 1840, went for William Henry Harrison. So it works. Making this about a culture and surrounding around a song and playing that song in city to city and rally to rally really generated optimism that this was a man who understood the common American and the plight that they were feeling in 1840. And that emergence of song, politics, and public rallies and just excitement led to uh, really the biggest election in terms of voter turnout uh, that the country's ever seen. Mm. And as a song itself, people are buying the song lyrics and the music for it so they can play it. And it becomes really one of the first uniquely American songs that doesn't come over from Europe. It doesn't have a European influence. This is an American song about an American politician that a lot of people, at least for the Whigs, really get behind. Um, it sparks even a whole round of new songs where the Democrats try to copy it, doesn't work as much. Uh, the Whigs try to replicate it with a song for Henry Clay in 1844. Also never has the same effect that Tip and Tie did in terms of tying culture, music, and politics together. Yeah. I'm, I'm really surprised, though, that no other campaign has tried to capitalize on the custom song, giant tin ball combination. <laughs> <laughs> those, are, those, are, th those are the winning factors, you know. Yeah. It's like Americans are cat. Just get a ball to distract us and to get our attention and it'll happen. But maybe that's what we need to get more than 50% voting turnout. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Well, it's interesting because um, before we went live, we were talking about the the political nature of of songs, you know, and in the 19th century, there are a number of those. And Jamie pointed out, you know, that John Brown's body is a, is, a, is a good example of that, you know, that he's right there in that area, nearly at Harper's Ferry, Jamie is right now, you know, and this idea of a song that was written by a New Englander about an event down here, you know, could spark such major cultural repercussions, you know, on both sides of the Potomac. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think people have a lot of sentimental and emotional attachment to songs now and then, where people really bought into this. They really see themselves in these lyrics for Tip and Tie. And for John Brown's body, while Southerners recoil from what happened in Harper's Ferry, there's people who see this is someone who's put into action feelings I've had about a crucial moral issue. And you see that play out through armies and camps as a way to solidify soldiers and rally around. Other songs take the same thing too, but songs take such a a cultural tie-in uh, that you see in John Brown's body is a, a very significant one nationally and locally. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. Did we have any questions coming in? None that we've got coming in yet from the crowd. All right, we're going to keep time. charging forward. <laughs> um, so my story is, is much less about an overt political um, political song or musicality in politics, but is is more about some some of the cultural revolution that happens in the early 20th century. Um, and is more specifically about Billy Pierce, who was born in Purcellville in 1890. He was the only child of a farming family um, who were also from Purcellville, an African-American family. Um, Billy went to school. He went to both Storer College in Harper's Ferry and also to Howard University before he mm -hmm. became a reporter. And so he was, he was a reporter in Chicago. He was he played the banjo for Diamond Dick's Medicine Show, of all things, one of the last medicine shows in America. Um, he also played the trombone and sang in different vaudeville shows. So he was kind of a, a renaissance man of talents. He was obviously very well educated. He was a credible reporter and he specialized in the art scene. He also went and fought in World War I with the 8th Illinois, um, which, which actually he served under um, 
the highest ranking black officer in the United States at the time. So that already is a is a fascinating life, is a really interesting person. Um, but then he came back from the war and went right back to work in Chicago reporting, but eventually ended up in New York City deciding that he was going to be a choreographer. In working the vaudeville circuit and being a musician, he saw this tremendous, you know, demand for dance, for choreography. And in the vaudeville circuit, the same with the minstrel shows and the same with now Broadway at this time, they are eating up traditionally Black avenues of expression, right? Whether that's song, whether that's movement, things like that. So the Harlem Renaissance is taking off in New York City as these individuals kind of percolate there and are actually taking charge of the art scene that had, you know, until this point really taken advantage Mm. of their thoughts and ideas and the things that they produced. Billy Pierce starts off by just renting a room on 46th Street in the same place where he is working as an elevator operator. And that is the beginning of Billy Pierce's dance school. Mm. But within a couple of years, it has grown to be two floors and five whole rooms in that building. And you have Buddy Bailey, who's a very well-known dance instructor with with Broadway is teaching classes there. So he himself, Billy Pierce is, he's, he dances, but he's more of the choreographer for, for groups when you're doing a show like a Broadway show. Um, and then Bailey would do more of the individual choreography. And their biggest hit, which I know is gonna ring a lot of bells, it won't, <laughs> is everyone knows the Charleston that was wildly popular in the 20s. It was a big deal, but that wasn't the only dance that happened in the 20s. In fact, by 1926, the Charleston was passe. You know, if you're doing the Charleston, it's like if you're out here doing the Fortnite dance, you know, like it's, no, it's, it's just not the, it's just not the newest thing anymore. Um, you got a floss now. No, I don't know. Um, so <laughs> Billy Pierce had worked um, with Ann Pennington uh, and Patrick Cola. They were two well-known dancers and performers on Broadway and they invented kind of repackaged this dance called the black bottom Mm -hmm. and there are many stories about where the black bottom where that name comes from where the dance comes from um some people attribute it to the black bottom swanee down swanee river you know people are familiar with the old old swanee river song and then it's about um getting your feet stuck in the mud and Mm -hmm. you're resting your feet out of the mud and that's where you get this kind of funky dance or it's about a cow that was stuck in the mud or it's about black bottom Detroit you know that area so there's kind of a there's a mythic quality about the origins of the song but it's a mythic quality in which neighborhoods all over the country can claim ownership or inspiration Mm. of this song Um, but it's Billy Pierce who who gets the unwritten credit mind you he's of course not formally recognized Um, But that launches his career in a new way. And so starting in in 1926, 1927, he is instrumental to a new hit musical almost every year for the next seven years. Um, And these are titles that are are not familiar to all of us now. But so the first one, The Black Bottom, was a feature song in George White's Scandals, which was a whole series. Um, And then he did the Sugarfoot Strut for Rita Rio. And then he did the Moaning Low for The Little Show. And it just, it goes on and on. And by 1930, he's so popular that he is brought overseas to consult with European directors as well. And mind you, 1930 is now the point where we're doing talkies. Huge game changer that there's, it's no longer silent film. So now we're seeing some of that music in those stances on screen and not just performed live. Um, and so he he consults with Max Reinhardt, and you see at this time a couple of short clips that are released. One in France that is like, oh, this is the true black bottom. This is the dance. This is how you do it, everybody. And it's this really formal couple in suits like shuffling around in a very obviously, you know, amended version of of the dance. And then even better, after France does it, of course, England does it too, right? (laughs) France has already done it. And the English version is even worse um, in terms of of syncopated action, in terms of 
you know, really. Yeah, of course it is. Of course it's of worse. Of course it is. Of course it's worse. <laughs> uh, because one thing, one thing that Billy Pierce really advocated for, and one thing that you've seen a lot of dance at the time, is what he called full body dancing, which is where if your lower half is moving, and you guys know in the 20s, it's like your ankles are going the opposite way of your knees and all this other stuff, then your hands and your elbows also need to be doing <laughs> wacky, wild things. Right. And so that was kind of the idea. There's, it's a, it's such an active dance type, you know, whether it's the black bottom or the the, sh the sugar foot strut. Um, but in England, they're just like barely shuffling their feet around. They're like not even moving. <laughs> it's it's pretty funny. So by 1930, he is a, a pretty big deal, even though most of the time, you know, these these black workers, these artists and these professionals are uncredited. Um, and he comes back to New York and he's working, but then he suffers a very sudden, um, it's, it's not a brain aneurysm, it was probably something that had been a problem before, but he dies very suddenly in 1933, he's only 43 years old. Um, so it's, it's really amazing to think of the, what could have been, you know, if, if, he, if he had lived a full life, just knowing the impact that he'd already had on mm. the Harlem Renaissance and on the culture of, of dance here in the United States. Um, it's also interesting that he also had an impact on, you know, here at home in, in Purcellville as well. After Billy Pierce's father passed away, the, the Loudoun County Emancipation Association nominated Billy to take his place on their board. So he was also very active in our local communities, um, you know, really raising the profile of you know, the African-American education system, the African-American culture that was happening here. In Percival, they had their own Fulton Horse Show for decades, and they had Emancipation Day celebrations that were, they went on for, I think, 100 years here. So it, it's really interesting to see someone who had an international profile and was still interested in what's going on, you know, back home in the little town. So I encourage you guys um, to, to do a little YouTube search for the black bottom, because there are, it's amazing. There are a few different kinds that you'll see, like the French and the English one. You'll of course see the Broadway version, which is the one that Billy Pierce helped choreograph. But then you'll see another couple of clips that claim to be like, oh, this is the original. Don't, don't listen to that Billy Pierce and their Broadway stuff. And so there, are, you'll, there are different examples, all 1920s, and it's, it's amazing too because there's most of them are silent. So it's just someone dancing in silence, um, and it, it looks silly, but it's really fun to to watch and to know the, the connections between mm. all of those. And I've also had the Black Bottom song stuck in my head for days now, so <laughs> everyone else has to at this point. Maybe that's the theme of tonight is getting songs stuck in your head that you can't get out that then drive you nuts. <laughs> yes. Have you been listening to to Bintai? Oh, I've got it tuned up on Spotify in case someone requested it that I could play the Mike Lee Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, we're gonna we're gonna forge along here with our timeline, and I think that's Mr. Matt Metz. Oh yeah, I'm gonna talk some about um, kind of the beginnings of. Well, I'm just gonna start with us um, talking about Ralph Stanley. Um, I used to play in a band called the Fox Hunt. We toured. Um, the country a number of times and we played a lot of bluegrass festivals around and one of the times um, or two times actually we got to play with Ralph Stanley um, mm -hmm. and I don't mean we got to go out there and play with him unfortunately we just got to open up for him and got to meet him and I uh, don't know that he remembers me but it was very significant <laughs> for me to get to meet him it was um, it was very cool um, we played with him once in Virginia and once in Shepherdstown at the Appalachian Heritage Festival that they put on there. Um, a couple of things I remember about seeing him. First of all, I'm just going to talk about how I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk <laughs> purely anecdotally because if, if you want to know about Ralph Stanley, go to Google it. There's an autobiography, there's all that stuff. So I'm going to share my experience and what I uh, kind of what he means to me. Um, mm. The first time. Uh, Yes, I saw him was just the coolest thing. It was kind of in, in yes, the genres yes, yes. that I was playing in. He was kind of the biggest thing. And to um, just make a pretty cheesy segue from the political stuff, I would say that in, in bluegrass music, if Bill Monroe is George Washington, then I would say <laughs> uh, Ralph Stanley is Thomas Jefferson. 
mm. definitely as if not more important than um than the father of you know um, of bluegrass bill monroe um one of the times i saw him he sang um amazing grace and he has a kind of a different way to sing it uh, a melody that's a little bit different um he sang it all by himself a cappella. Um, and I think that all of the people in the room actually floated off the floor just a little bit. <laughs> so stirring and so haunting. His voice by the end of his life was unlike anybody. No one could replicate the way he sings. Um, uh, in pop culture, people know Ralph Stanley from the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Uh, mm. Where Art Thou? He sang, well, he sang Oh Death during a, um, one of the scenes. And that voice, um, the way he sings and the way he plays with the melody is really, I mean, even the best bluegrass singers cannot do that. Um, he comes from a time when um, you sang and you learned to sing um, without a microphone. There was no mm -hmm. such thing as working a mic or, or learning how to use a microphone or anything. He sang in like the Baptist tradition, um, which is sing as loud as you can all the time. And you sing, it is pretty much like yelling. I mean, he sings very, very loud. Um, and that voice that he had, especially by the end of his life, that's how you get that voice is you start out singing as a little kid. You're a good singer to start with and you are always just absolutely belting out your pipes. Um, so that's kind of, his voice is to me, un, you know, it's unparalleled. It's, it's so cool. I will not even try to do it or demonstrate it, um, mm -hmm. but I absolutely love it. Um, one of the times we played with him, his uh, bus broke down and um, a friend of ours named John Lilly, he um, was, somebody called and said, hey, the bus broke down. And the, unfortunately, the bass player is also the <laughs> bus driver. So the bus, the bass player had to stay with the bus driver, I mean, with the bus. And they said, can anybody play bass? And who knows the most Ralph Stanley songs? And so um, John Lilly stepped up and was like, I can do it. And he played the whole set all the way through. So he got to be in the um, Clint Mountain Boys for one show, which wow. was very cool for all of us to see. Um, Matt, can I interrupt for one second? Yeah. So when um, Anne-Marie and Travis were talking to me about tonight and who to bring together, how to um, make this awesome. And I'm like, well, I got a buddy who plays banjo. I'm pretty sure I could get him to talk about Ralph Stanley. So I reach out to Matt and Matt's like, well, I am by no means any expert on Ralph Stanley, but you know, I've, I've met him and I've played <laughs> shows where he's had like, yeah, done. That's, <laughs> uh, <sorry. laughs> that's yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it, I mean, it was very cool. I mean, it's like meeting him is, I mean, he's so cool because he's like a, a, he was a time capsule. He was like from an era uh, where everything was different. Mm -hmm. um, the way he learned to play music, he was the last generation of, of mountain people and, and country people that learned to play in the old school traditional way, which is you don't learn from sheet music. You're not learning from songs off the radio. You don't get on the online guitar archive like we all did growing up learning how to play guitar and stuff you learn from your family. You learn mm. from people in your community. Um, and a lot of the people, you know, Earl Scruggs is one, Bill Monroe, all of them have the stories of the handful of people that they learn from. Mm. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and play a tune of his. Um, this is, he says that this is the first tune that he learned. He says he learned it from his mom, um, who apparently also played ban banjo. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and play it and I'll talk a little bit about the style. Thank <laughs> you. 
said he says on an album of his it's called down to ride i think it starts with that tune and he says i'm gonna play the first tune i learned to play learn from a mountain called shout little luli so that's that's that song is called shout little luli it's all there's other versions of it called shout lulu shout and lulu um mm -hmm. that's kind of a common old time banjo tune um ralph stanley played um music before there was a term bluegrass music um, he played, um, when he played, I imagine learning, he, they would have called it old time music. They would have called it music. There was not 3000 genres, um, for people like that. And he probably knew of other genres of music, but, um, like I said, most of what they played would have been handed down music mm -hmm. that they were, most of the music they heard would have been music that was made by people in their family or in their community. Um, that's Ralph Stanley played two styles of banjo. He played that style, which is called claw hammer. Um, that is where there's a repetitive um, two strokes down and then one thumb stroke. Um, and then you can do as much with it as you can. He also had his own um, finger style um, mm. that was kind of similar um, to like a Scruggs style, Earl Scruggs style. Um, he played three fingers. Um, Ralph Stanley played two. Um, I think he sometimes played three, but he also played in a way that was that classic bluegrass banjo sound. Um, when he started playing with his brother, uh, Carter Stanley, um, they started out playing Bill Monroe tunes. And that's really where the tune bluegrass came from. That is um, people playing Bill Monroe and his bluegrass boys. They are essentially cover bands of Bill Monroe and, and, and the bluegrass boys. So the term bluegrass, comes from Kentucky because Bill Monroe came, gave, you know, gave his band the, the name Bluegrass Boys because they're, they're he was from Kentucky and a lot of the members eventually were, were um, from Kentucky. They eventually ended up being from all over the United States, but um, that, that term didn't come around until it was like, well, hey, what do you play? Oh, we play Bluegrass. We play, uh, you know, the Bluegrass Boys. We play like Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys. And eventually that term became um, the genre of bluegrass it mm. essentially started with people being Bill Monroe um, cover bands. Um, that time when they were coming up was an especially popular time for traditional musics and for people innovating with uh, country music and playing around with the old school, with the old formats of country music. Um, country mu or old time music would have been mostly a pastime, a recreation, a way to um, provide music for dances and social gatherings. Um, when it turned, when old time music started morphing into bluegrass music, it started turning into more of a performance based music rather than a um, way to facilitate like a party or a dance or something. Um, so instead of playing a, tu a, a tune like that, where you're just playing the tune repetitively might turn into you know, you're doing all these tricks and licks and that's when the bluegrass stuff really became, hey, watch me, here's my turn, here's my turn, here's my turn. And that's really the hallmark of bluegrass music is, is those, uh, you know, here's my turn to show off. Yeah. Um, um, that, so that's kind of what it morphed into. And he was definitely good at that. He could do that um, on the banjo for sure. Um, towards the end of his life, he kind of did not, he didn't have the manual dexterity anymore to do that finger style so he went back to playing all the claw hammer style and his style was very very driving whether he was mm -hmm. playing finger style or um the frailing it's called claw hammer 
frailing, thumping. There's a lot of different words for it. Um, both of the ways he played, he played it like he sang, which is all the way hard, hundred <laughs> percent play it hard. Um, he played his banjo. Um, he played his banjo around this part, which if you're a guitar player or a musician, you know, that's like the sharpest, brightest sound you can do. Um, and the loudest. And, and that's kind of where, where he did his playing. Um, I'm going to play one more tune and then I'll kind of pass it on. Um, he was, he had, a, you know, he had one of his bands was called, or his band was called the Clinch Mountain Boys. Um, Clinch Mountain is about as far in Virginia as you can get from Northern Virginia. It is all the way Southwest Virginia down near like the uh, Cumberland Gap, um, the Wilderness Trail. Um, he had a lot of tunes named after the Clinch Mountain. Um, he had a couple of tunes. I'm going to play a tune called Clinch Mountain Backstep. He played this tune um, using his fingers, like finger style. I don't play in that way. I only play in the claw hammer style. So I'm going to play it that way. This tune is what's called modal or mountain modal. So it is neither major nor minor for those of you music geeks out there. That was very common in the in old time playing. Um, you would have um, sometimes in pop music or whatever, you have a tune that's in a minor key and you have another song that's in a major key. Well, in modal, it was like indetermined. So um, that's what this style is. This, this song um, borrows a lot from old like modal banjo tunes. So while he did make this tune up, there's a lot of licks in there that are straight out of other tunes. And that is very common for the old time genre and the bluegrass genre is there is a, there's a lot of licks out there to pull from and there's really a limitless way to arrange those licks. So um, if there's no questions or anything to add, I'll go ahead and finish up by playing um, a tune called Clinch Mountain Backstep. This is a, um, yeah, yeah, here we go. getting a lot of comments of people who are really enjoying the music just want to give you guys um a shout out matt everyone's really enjoying it um, i think it's really interesting because obviously there are a lot of um british isles influence into what we think of as bluegrass that appalachian sound you know being scots irish and you know having having those kinds of roots and mm -hmm. i guess um this isn't so much of a question but i just i, I think it's so interesting that about the same time that that music is being played for communities, you know, in the mountain areas, you know, it's it's the same time that there are um, that there are dance halls playing the the black bottom, you know, and doing and doing what we think of as as jazz, you know, in its in its earlier forms. It's just yeah. fascinating. 
Yeah, and I think of that a little bit with Mountain Music. Mountain Music was definitely a, um, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of music that started in the mountains and, and stayed in the mountains. But at the same time, people that lived way out, they didn't have the internet, they didn't have all of the news delivery services, and they didn't have cultural interaction as much as people in the cities. So a lot of those um, things that happened in a bygone era, like when in the first, like maybe around the turn of the century, when banjo was a really popular thing in vaudeville, in yeah. jazz, and, and a lot of like banjo's history doesn't start out in the country. It starts out in, in music clubs and jazz clubs, and, and, and eventually it gets out into the country. And well, when it falls out of favor with people in the cities, it is still right. uh, going in the country and people are turning it into their own traditions. So um, it's, it's not, it doesn't have a purely old mm. archaic history like we think it does. It, they were made in big, big cities and factories in Boston, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Um, and then they were played in big music and jazz clubs and stuff like that. Um, one thing I do want to add about the history of banjo playing um, is that style, claw hammer style, is an African American style. And so, I was curious because I knew that the banjo has a history, of course, with the African community. Exactly, and the here. first the first banjos were found on plantations. The first banjos were found in plantations in in um, uh, western or uh, eastern Maryland, um, and they were made that made out of gourds, and they played in a style like that with a drone string that stayed the same note on the top, and mm -hmm. they're still. Um, people there's been people that have you know ethnomusicologists that go around looking for for um traces of their own music they um have found people in africa in in i, I believe oh. in western africa that play a style on an instrument that is very similar to a banjo mm -hmm. and very similar to that claw hammer style and on that before we move on everybody keeps coming back to this point so i'm not sure if i'm just pointing out the obvious or not, but as, um, as a musician and coming from a long line of musicians, um, the reason why you were talking, Amory, about music having legs, and we might have been talking about that before we went live, but how music travels and the reason it does that mm -hmm. is because um, you're bringing home with you, right? You're, you have the thing that comforts you, the song that your mommy used to sing you, when you were little and you were scared to make you feel better or for me um one of the most poignant memories for me was with my grandmother while she was dying of cancer I have a huge family all can sing all um jump in with these marvelous harmonies and I remember singing how great thou art to her as she's passing away and still to this day, I mean, it takes me right back to that moment in a, the most wonderful way, the most um, unified way. So that's why music travels. That's why banjos come with people. They're bringing something uh, with them from home and that continues and that will always continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a wonderful point. All right. Oh, and then uh, Jamie, you have something to add here. Um, in this timeline too of the early to mid 20th century. Uh, yeah, I was just gonna uh, jump on um, sort of a uh, transition from the people who would inherit uh, clan, uh, Ralph Stanley's legacy. Mm -hmm. And I think a really cool story, uh, which I fell in love with when I heard it, um, was how uh, Ricky Skaggs, great, um, a bluegrass legend, um, how he and his father want, went to go see Ralph Stanley um, in the Clinch Mountain Boys. And uh, they got there uh, before the band did because the, 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 uh, the bus was um, delayed, which seems to be a tie in Ralph Stanley. <laughs> yeah, there's a <laughs> bus <laughs> problem thing. Yeah, he doesn't have a bus. Like a mechanic uh, or something. Um, but uh, they... Uh, uh, Ricky Skaggs and his father always went to shows with their instruments. I guess it's sort of a, you know, a lot of times a folk tradition and the manager or the owner, club owner came out and noticed that everyone had showed up for the star and the star wasn't there. And he said, yeah, all right, you two get up there. And so um, they were already such great musicians that when Ralph Stanley got to his, I guess, uh, dressing room and heard the music coming, he thought it was his own band rehearsing. And um, I, what I love about music um, is sort of that mentoring aspect that happens among so many musicians, whether it's um, 
the great blues player Robert Johnson taking on um, Robert, a guy named Robert Lockwood his, as his sort of uh, de facto son and showing him things or it's this, maybe it's master and journeyman uh, apprentice kind of thing that comes through music and it continues and you can see it throughout history. But that sort of catapulted Ricky Skaggs um, and uh, it, uh, sort of right place, right time. Um, and he has a song uh, called My Father's Son, which I really encourage anybody to look up the lyrics um, because uh, what attracts me to great songwriting is a universal quality that transcends um, color or class or all these things. And I think what Bess was sort of talking about, about bringing songs with you, uh, um, songs are so portable. We think about books being uh, dispersed, but you still need a typesetter or you need someone to write something down. If you know a melody, I mean, like language, a melody doesn't know a border. Mm -hmm. And so if you are somebody who can um, uh, interpret a melody, you can take that wherever you go. And that has many uses, whether it's a resistance as a field holler, um, the work is so hard, but we're going to find uh, a pain, uh, joy through the pain or whether it's exaltation in the church. Um, I think the portability of songs is what will make them last um, forever. Um, but I'm, I'll play like a, a verse or two and a chorus from my father's son. But um, I just want to read the lyrics for the for the chorus, which I think are so universal, which is, um, well, a rich man writes the book of laws, a poor man must defend, um, but the highest laws are written on the hearts of honest men. If that cup is passed to me to do what must be done, when they lay me down, remind them I was just my father's son. And I really love, I love the am, am sort of ambivalence, maybe not ambivalence, but the multidimensional aspect of the end, yes. because who, who can uh, carry the load of a previous generation um, and walk in those shoes? And I love sort of just this, I'm, you know, going to do what must be done. But when they, when you lay me down, remind me, this is the family I'm coming from. So um, anyway, so I encourage people to look up the lyrics. My history is no secret. It's written in the stones in the hill beside this river. Rest my mother's gentle bones. Daddy there beside her, among her next of kin, and their legacy passed down to me, sons of mountain men. Raised to be a miner, by miners' callous hands, passed my youth between these mountains, where I grew to understand. The family was the word of God, and faith was its demand. In life and death, the same came from the coal beneath this land. Will a rich man rise the book of laws? A poor man must defend. But the highest laws are written on the hearts of honest men. If that cup is passed to me, to do what must be done. When they lay me down, remind them I was just my father's son. So it's, it's a beautiful song about um, place and people. Um, and I love life and death. Both life and death came from the cold beneath this land. You know, what take any resource through history which makes makes households and or makes a middle class or makes security and then take that away or take the dangers that go for procuring that you know so i think that is a uh, is super super poignant but i think you're right jamie the idea that it's like it's at the same time so personal but so universal yeah you're right yeah yeah and then more on top of that so those words are incredible right those words alone could change your whole life if you just focused on them for a good solid month, right? But then you add in the chord progressions True. and that I think it was a minor chord all of a sudden in the mm. middle of that other that it's all of a sudden makes your, you're asking a question that caught your attention. That is the magic. That's the difference between wonderful words, important words. And then the reason we set them to music is we can make you feel something 
that the words alone wouldn't have been able to make you feel. Sure. And I think that's the mania, the mania and the devil and the details for songwriters is uh, just close is not enough. And so mm-hmm. you can, it can become a, a, a dangerous or a beautiful obsession chasing that craft. And so like Bess is saying, yeah, that minor, that little minor dip really, really pulls something. Um, the last thing I, I, I want to add is that um, there's a really, uh, I think I mentioned this in an email, but there's some really powerful uh, sessions that have been going on since the mid nineties uh, called the transatlantic sessions. Um, and what this basically constitutes are um, country folk Americana players from the quote unquote new world because we're, we are a young country, um, going back across the pond um, to the aisles and to, um, to, to uh, really cross-pollinate with, uh, with, we were talking about the Scottish and the English strain that's so evident in this Appalachian experience. And um, uh, where I learned my father's son was actually from watching these transatlantic sessions with Ricky Skaggs playing with these incredible Irish players. Um, so the, I think it's like almost like the prodigal son coming home and why we can't really be on a porch in Southwest Virginia in you know, 1917 or whatever. I think when we, in a really cool way, when you listen to these transatlantic sessions, maybe even more, you can actually hear the old world and the new world colliding in that really cool musical mixing bowl. So yeah, I definitely recommend checking that out. Yeah, I found that like, um... People from Ireland love to look back at like look on bluegrass music and American music, especially American traditional music. Like oh, that's that's like our young nephew or something. Yeah. They they they, they just really love it. So that's kind of well, well, tell us about tell Travis. Tell us about Patsy Klein. Sure. Yeah, we're gonna kind of transition in the middle of the 20th century. Um, you know, a lot of the music we've been talking about is kind of intensely regional up to that point. You know, they, they call it hillbilly music or, you know, mountain music, old timey music. Um, but in the 20th century, mid 20th century, the decade or two after World War II, that's going to become a national phenomenon. You know, it's mm-hmm. really going to transcend this southern Appalachian background and become something that people listen to across the country. And a huge part of of that story of that transition actually centers around our area, centers around Washington, D.C., centers around um, Northern Virginia. And and there's a few different individuals that are responsible for that. Um, One little bit of background I do want to give is, you know, during the war, a ton of people, you know, who lived in these areas that have been ravaged by the Depression, where poverty has been kind of the, the standard for generations, are moving to the cities, you know, they're working in the defense industry. So these people are taking kind of like what Bess mentioned earlier, they're bringing this music that reminds them of home to places like Washington or Baltimore or Detroit or Chicago. And, you know, that's going to play a huge part in this story. Um, but as you, you kind of alluded to, um, someone else that I think is particularly pertinent to this story is Patsy Cline, um, you know, probably the most famous musician to come out of our particular, you know, part of the world. Um, you know, she's she's born in 1932 in Winchester. Um, Virginia Hensley is her, her birth name. Um, very, very troubled childhood. I don't want to get too much into it, but, you know, the family moves over a dozen times during her youth. Um, they actually live here in Loudoun County for a time. Um, they live in, in Round Hill, just west of Percival. Patsy goes to school there in Lincoln, just outside of Percival for a little while. Um, but where her kind of the transformative moment in her life comes when she's 13 years old, um, she suffers this very severe infection in her throat. She nearly uh-huh. dies. You know, according to her, her heart stops. And when she recovers, she finds that she's mm-hmm. left with this very changed voice. She says it's a booming voice like Kate Smith's. And that is going to become kind of her signature throughout her entire career. You know, she has this, you know, for, for a female singer, a, kind of a deep, almost husky, smoky voice. Um, and she, you know, like you were saying with Ralph Stanley, she never holds back. You know, I mean, she puts emotion into her songs. And that's something that she's going to become known for even as a teenager. Um, you know, she drops out of school at 15 to support her family. 
Um, she's going to be playing local shows around Northern Virginia, a lot of places that we know about um, and can still visit today. Um, if you go to the old Legion Hall in Berryville, which is now the Dollar General, um, mm -hmm. she used to play there. She would play at the racetrack in Charlestown, um, which of course is still there, Rockwood Hall down in Warrington. So all of these areas that are within our community today, you know, this young, unknown teenage girl, Virginia Hensley, is playing these, you know, when she's 16, 17, 18 years old, um, which I find, you know, absolutely mind boggling. Um, one of the places she played most often was actually the Moose Lodge up in Brunswick, Maryland, um, mm -hmm. right across the river. And that is where she's going to meet her first husband, a guy named Gerald Klein, um, who, who ran a construction business up in Frederick. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, like this is where Virginia Hensley kind of transforms in 1953. She gets married, so she takes the last name Klein. At the same time, one of her band bandmates suggests she she, you know, pick a better stage name. So she starts going by her nickname, and Virginia Hensley becomes Patsy Klein. And that is, of course, how she'll be remembered forever. See, um, you need to rock and roll name. It's important. What, mm -hmm. What's that? I said, see, you need a rock and roll name. It's important. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Virginia's maybe not the most rock and roll name. But, uh, um, right around this time is when she gets her first big break. Um, she plays at the National Country Music Contest at Whipperwill Lake, which is down outside of Warrington. And this is a, like a fascinating thing. Um, this contest is organized by a man named Connie Gay. Um, Connie Gay is really the unsung local hero of country music history. Um, you know, he's from North Carolina. He comes to the Washington area during the war, and he really is responsible almost single-handedly for bringing country music to this area. Mm -hmm. um, he's going to start uh, first on the radio, um, W A R A, uh, excuse me, W A R L out of Arlington. Um, he starts a, a show called Town and Country Time. Um, that gets picked up in syndication kind of across the country. You know, dozens and dozens of stations pick it up. Um, in 1947, he hosts like the big first big country music show in the area at like a highbrow establishment. Um, he gets a bunch of Grand Ole Opry stars to play at Constitution Hall. You know, people like Grandpa Jones, Eddie Arnold, Minnie Pearl, they all show up. Um, and this, for a lot of people in the Washington area, is their first exposure to this kind of music. And he uses contests like this National Country Music Championship as a way to scout local talent. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to pick up on Patsy Cline. Um, she's one of the first regular stars on his television show that's going to premiere in 1954. Um, you know, they record... In, in Washington, D.C. at Turner's Arena. And again, just like his radio show, this is gonna get picked up in syndication coast to coast. Um, you know, not only is Patsy Cline a regular, but this is also where Jimmy Dean gets his, his big mm -hmm. break. Um, probably more well-known for Sausage nowadays, but you know, certainly a huge star of both music and television in his time. Uh, Roy Clark, um, also later known as the host of Hee Haw, um, but again, a, a fantastic musician. They all get their start in this, this town and country TV show that Connie Gay is running. Um, and like, you know, again, I cannot understate the importance of Connie Gay because he, you know, he owns clubs in the DC area. Um, he, he makes millions as a music producer, is one of the founders of the Country Music Association. So, um, like I said, single-handedly brings this music to an audience that that is not familiar with it and really helps make country music a, mm -hmm. a nationwide phenomenon. Um, so Patsy Cline becomes a regular on his show through the 50s. Um, she's still going to play locally. She plays a lot of shows down at the Watermelon Park in Clark County. Some of us have, have been there before. Um, club Hillbilly, which was Connie Gay's club in, in – uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. She's playing there. So again, own it, right? If they're going to call it Hilly Billy music. Yep. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, that's a whole nother thing we can get into, but, uh, <laughs> um, but her, her, her big break nationally is going to come in 1957. And oddly enough, it has another interesting heritage area connection. Um, she appears on Arthur Godfrey's Talent Scouts. Now, this is like the American idol of its day. And, and the reason why this is kind of strange is Arthur Godfrey 
actually lives in Leesburg, Virginia. Um, he would fly back and forth from Leesburg to New York to film this show, um, which was one of the hugest shows, kind of the biggest variety show on television at the time. And this young singer from Winchester, Virginia gets up and she is going to sing what would become one of her signature songs, uh, Walking After Midnight. You know, not a song that she was particularly excited to, to sing, apparently. Um, but she gets up, she, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, she performs and almost overnight the song explodes, you know, hits number two on the country charts and most importantly, number 12 on the pop charts. And mm -hmm. she becomes the first female artist to become a crossover hit, you know, not just this hillbilly regional Southern music, but, you know, the pop charts as well, um, you know, nationwide appeal. Um, I don't want to get too much into Patsy Cline. I, I, I can't tell you how much I love Patsy Cline. You know, best story about hearing your mother sing songs. My mother used to sing Patsy Cline to me as a child. So, you know, kind of uh, very personal for me. But, you know, by the early 60s, Patsy Cline is the biggest female superstar in country, really the first female superstar. I mean, there have been others, you know, Patsy Mon Montana, Kitty Wells, but she really succeeds as a crossover artist with wide massive appeal um of course that would be cut tragically short by her death um in 1963 she's only 30 years old which again i think is remarkable that this woman can have such a tremendous impact on music um when her career was was just so tragically short and i know Bess, i don't want to step on your toes because you have a lot to say about patsy as well so i want to hear it no, you're not stepping on any toes. I just was going to pause you there because one of the songs I'd chosen to do tonight was uh, Walking After Midnight because I thought that was that was her big break, right? That's what so many musicians are waiting for is that one <laughs> that's going to make the difference. I go out walking after midnight out in the moonlight just like we used to do, I'm always walking after midnight, searching for you. I walk from my hooks along the highway, well that's just my way of the saying I love you. I'm always walking after midnight. Searching for you. I stopped to see a weeping willow crying on his pillow. Maybe he's crying for me. And as the sky streams of me, now his whisper took me. I'm lonesome as I can be. I go walking. After midnight, out in the moonlight, just like we used to do, I'm always walking. After midnight, searching for you. I go out walking after midnight, searching for you. I will drink to that. Yes. Oh, I love it. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. I had no idea. You don't, it's so fascinating when you hear, you know, she dies at 30. Yep. Right. You know, for so many people like that, you don't even think about it. When you think Patsy Klein, you think of like a lifetime worth of achievements. And then when you hear that, you're reminded of it, you know, cut so short and in such a short period of time, having such a dramatic impact. And really, like the height of her career is really like 1961 to 63. It's only a few years yeah. that she's really at the top of her game. You know, she worked for, for a decade basically to get there. And then, you know, um, and it's also like kind of going back to what I was talking about, this transitional period. She really also, I think, marks a transition in kind of country music as a whole. You know, you look at early... Patsy Klein, it's very influenced by this kind of like cowboy Western, you know, she was mm. dressing up in the boots and the hat and everything. Um, but then, you know, when she gets to Nashville, it's, it's her, her sound kind of transitions to, into a more sophisticated kind of 
you know, um, what we, I go, going back to, would think of as like the Nashville sound, you know, it's kind of like softer, you know, the backing vocals and, and this poppier crossover stuff. But, um, you know, I, just her voice alone, I think, is what allows her to transcend any of that. You know, she has this unforgettable voice and the way she sings, like really, I don't know, it pierces you, you know. Um, I I love Patsy Klein. <laughs> I have a quote from one of her producers that um, it's just too perfect. That there was no reason for me to try to say anything else. Patsy was capable of growling and purring, and then vaulting octaves with ease. Patsy could give you a window into her soul. You feel like you're hearing exactly how Patsy feels, like she's coming over for coffee and spilling out her heart over your kitchen table. Yeah. That's great. That's uh, beautiful. Uh, yeah. That's that was my one. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Travis, we've just... mentioned Nashville several times and country, obviously, throughout. Um, we'll at best keep going, but then after, remind me that we've got a question from the audience, too, um, about some country music and portrayals in it. Um, so remind me to go back to that after best is done. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So I I'll just do want... my best. I'm not a music historian, but I'll do my best. I just love music. So. <laughs> I um I just wanted to talk for a little bit. I was hoping to sing more than talk because I am certainly not the sharpest knife in this box. But um, first and less importantly to me, I wanted to talk to about her influences over the business. Hmm. Um, you know, she found success in both the country charts and pop charts, um, an accomplishment that artists are still trying to achieve this day. If you can make that crossover, and what you're t you were talking about, Travis, particularly. Um, most country songs at her time had three chords. Most country songs still today have three chords. <laughs> That's why I can play the country songs. Um, but she, uh, the music that was chosen for her more often than not, had these wonderful, complicated Bing Crosby chords mm. that are just impossible, right? You're like, what is, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> That's when I have to call people like Jamie Potter and be like, explain to me what all of those little marks mean after all of that. Um, and so that's the sophisticated sound that you're talking mm -hmm. about. It's complicated. And what I love about singing Patsy Klein, just on a personal note, uh, the way that producer described it, a vaulting over octaves, um, she is playing with you. <laughs> she is literally toying with you and just showing off. It is so fun to sing her songs because just like you said, she'll start out all growly and then all of a sudden you're somewhere else. You're <laughs> up in some other octave um, just blowing her, her people away. So anyways, back to her business and her influences over the business. She's considered the first badass of country music, woman badass of country music um, because she would take no, I don't know how many words I'm allowed to say here in this. <laughs> she, she would not take any stink from anybody. Um, she actually petitioned the Grand Old Opry for admittance. She was the first person to do this. You before oh. that had to be invited. And she was like, no, no, no. I am going to be a part I'm of it. I'm going to invite myself. Right. You're going to invite me. <laughs> yeah, obviously you just don't know yet. And that's fine. Nobody can mm -hmm. blame you. Um, she was the first female to receive top billing, um, which is kind of incredible. Obviously, she was advocating for herself. Who on earth, who on earth was walking in for her and saying, "No, no, no, we're going to change everything about the way you have been doing it." Obviously, this was her. And on that same note, at the time, <laughs> with the the article I was reading was saying, at this time, club owners frequently like to shirk their responsibility of payment. And I'm like, at that time, I was like, that's happened to me at least four or five times. <laughs> yeah. You're getting paid and exposure, I, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's a gift. And I'm like, I'm happy to give you the gift of music. But we had the agreement here. She had uh, her quotes were, no dough, no show. Either you pay me ahead of time or I don't sing. That, yeah. That's incredible, <laughs> right? That um, that takes some stank that I don't, I don't know that I have. Yeah. Um, in 1973, she was the first female solo artist inducted in the Country Music Hall of Fame. Um, she's had a movie made about her, a Broadway show made about her. Um, obviously, she influenced the business. But 
what I want to talk about more is that is not what makes you a legend, right? What makes you a legend is that I can play Patsy Cline for my children mm. and they can feel what she's feeling. Just like you were saying, Travis, that is what legends are made of, is this ability to connect. Mm. The reason why music can travel is that the collective human experience is the same, right? We've all had our hearts broken um, and we can relate to that. Um, you know, as I said earlier, most of these songs were chosen for her. All of her big hits were songs that mm -hmm. she didn't want to sing. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so one of the bass players gave an interview about working with her once. And he said, I think she was able to put so much feeling into her songs because she was mad at her record label for yeah. many years. <laughs> and, you know, whatever works is fine, but I want to believe something else. And, you know, she's not here to vouch for herself. So this is what I'm going with, is that we, all of us musicians have had to play songs we didn't want to play, right? That doesn't mean that we can't sit in that pot for a minute. That doesn't mean that we can't do the best by that song just for the sake of the song right mm -hmm. you still um, mean it right and that's that's what i hear when i'm listening to her is that um she she so naturally and effortlessly understood how to make mm -hmm. people feel what these words were and to draw them in and that's the stuff of legends right um I'm so sorry, one second. I want to make sure I'm not going to leave anything out. Um, so I said, uh, so they become legends because they connect with their listeners on a level beyond time or culture. So like I was saying about our children being able to listen and forever, these songs will mean something forever. Um, she knew how to break your heart and people love it. And people, a lot of the masses, they'll say that they don't want sad songs. They don't want to wallow. This is not true. <laughs> people, <laughs> people, people want to be moved, right? And sometimes right. we want to move to laugh, and sometimes we want yeah. to move to cry, and sometimes we want to feel united. Like you were talking about, Joseph, I love your story about uh, the presidential campaign, and all that means to me is that people want to be united. And honestly, they'll jump behind anything if they can mm -hmm. if they can sing a song while they're marching along, right? <laughs> yeah. I think you make a great point, and I think you all made great points about lyrics and you know the most memorable songs that we all have personally you know well the music's great we love music it's really the lyrics that make it resonate beyond just enjoying the song and from you know memories that it brings up you know ways it helps you get through certain events one thing that transcends time periods and genres of music is that it's the lyrics that really take a song to the next level hmm yeah so you can see behind me i like to read old books um and i was uh, long story short a friend of mine passed away a little less than a year ago and he had a wonderful incredible collection of a lifetime <laughs> books and um his daughter was helping me to go through them and she's like why would you want any of these old stories and i told her mm -hmm. i said i like the old stories for the same reason i like the old songs is that I need to know that somebody's already done this, that somebody yeah. has already lost what I've lost, somebody's already grieved what I am grieving, and mm -hmm. that they moved on, right? There's no new stories. Um, and so when all this started, Amory, you had sent the email asking uh, to talk about some, uh, something about the, the longevity of music and when you have something authentic, how yes. that's unstoppable, right? Um, the reason it's unstoppable is that there's nothing new and people want to feel that and they want to feel um, that mm. they're not the only one and they're not the first one and they're not going to be the last one. Yeah. yeah. And I think I think that's insightful, too, because some of, I feel the same about a lot of those things that you said with books is, you know, history is the same way, too. You know, and how often do we get wrapped up in a political campaign? And then we learned the media back in 1840 was already, you know, yeah, deciding on what the narrative was. And, <laughs> you know, but then, you know, people, people did feel heartbreak and sure. they expressed it, you know, and, and that we can go back and, you know, trace, trace those stories and learn from them, but reassured that like, well, we still got 
happier, you know, after, after all of that. Exactly. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll leave this part up to you. I've got strange by pacifying, which again, I mean, both of them are so relevant to any time period. We got strange or I've got, she's got you. Oh, she's got you, please. Okay. Please, please, please. <laughs> Great. While you're getting started, Bess, I'll just say, like, I've met a number of people. I, I would say it's hard to find a Northern Virginia, a Northern Virginian of a certain age that doesn't have their own little Patsy Klein story. <laughs> you know, a person I used to live next to, he's like, oh, yeah, there used to be a dance hall up on the West Virginia, Virginia state line. And she would come out there and it was always a big deal. And everybody has like, well, I saw her at Rainbow Road. She used to come out there. Everybody has their own, like I would say, people in their, you know, 70s and 80s. They all have sure. their own, especially people from Winchester. They all have their own Patsy Klein story yeah. that, that they can relate, which is very cool to be like in, in that area and hear her playing all these places. Like, oh, I drove by that place. And now it's, uh, you know, a, a lawn and garden center or something. Yeah. Patsy Klein used to play there, you know. All right. I've got you in a picture that you gave to me. And it's a love just like it used to be. The only thing different. I've got you in a picture And she's got you well, I've got the records That we used to share And they still sound the same Just like when you were here the only thing different, the only thing new, is I've got the records, and she's got you. Well, I've got your memory, or has it got me? I really don't know what I know. Well, that proved you care. And it still looks the same, just like when you were here. The only thing different, the only thing new. So I've got these little things, and she's got you. Oh, 
Like one that. of my favorite little stories uh, for Passy Klein, as long as we're still on the subject for a quick moment, um, recent trip to the museum. One thing that a lot of people don't know was that uh, her mother was a master seamstress. And yes, um, uh, when I say that, she could take a drawing, which Patsy, all those, what you see from the cowboy era, sure, she when she had a little bit of money, she went and went on spree and got a couple, you know, really high-end things. But all yeah. the original... Um, outfits that she wears at even to the Jimmy Dean show in DC and all that stuff up to New York her mom um, sewed every part of it and so you will see what which to me is one of the most um, you know great stories mothers and daughters uh, when you go to the museum and it changes but one of the recent uh, installations are Patsy's drawings indicating how she wants the hemline how she wants this um, so we talked about, you know, not only was she an absolute badass, first kind of crossover country music badass, um, but she understood very astutely for somebody of such a young age that even talent is one part of the cocktail, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, like she had a voice that is still leagues beyond, you know, like is so legendary, but she knew, and I think that's the old school of entertainment and music and i think about how boring my stage show is with our band um just playing the songs i you... think to differ i think you have colored lights that flash because i borrowed them that's, the, that's all we that's that's uh, that was the <laughs> like, we got to do something there's no dog dancing or whatever like we could probably get that but you really think about this older <laughs> this older um generation of uh you know not just like maybe Fred Astaire and, and different side of the tracks there, but there was so much more of a composite thing of what it meant to be an entertainer. And so for, for me, somebody who is sort of an introvert, extrovert and loves music and the confessional side of songwriting, all this stuff, it really blows me away uh, when I see somebody who does, does all of that. The last time I was at Robert's Western World in Nashville, um, which is such a great spot. Um, everything fried and only bottled beer. Um, there was a, <laughs> there's this band that comes in, the Tennessee Tone Boys, and this guy walks in with the biggest pompadour hair do I've ever seen, wearing a cheetah skin jacket and shoes. And this is like 1950s revelation. And I'm blown away. And I'm like, there's no, there's this guy is like looks too cool. There's no way he plays guitar as well as he could. And <laughs> playing guitar well he's ukrainian and he knows country music better than us and throughout the set uh drummer bass player upright bass player and guitarist they're switching instruments the bass player is crawling up on the neck of his um bass guitar and just to kind of draw things really close um we talk about the monetization of this stuff these guys were playing for tips i mean tips on a two o'clock like so whenever you get down in the mouth if you're a creative person being like i'm just not making money from this the greatest telecaster pompadour hair yeah. skin jacket multi-instrumentalist probably in the world is playing tomorrow at 3 p.m at robert's western roll for half off hot dogs um <laughs> so just to bring it full circle and I will just close with the one quote from Van Morrison is that uh, music is spiritual. The music business is not. And I think, <laughs> I think that, that, that sums up well. Uh, yeah, we actually had a question, it sounds like, Joe, about the music industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah we have maybe we can talk off air because like at the Nashville Country Music uh, Museum, I have a ton of questions that I was going to get your opinions on. But someone asked, uh, actually it was Allison Herring, uh, asked about the Ken Burns documentary on country music. If you three had any uh, particular thoughts on how that portrayed everything, who's leading off? I'll, I'll leave it to the musicians. <laughs> I, I will say that I have only seen the first um, episode, and for me and where my interests lie, it was really great. Um, you know, really being a fan of the traditional music and the um, changeover from traditional music into, you know, like, especially um, traditional mountain music and old time music. Um, I, I thought they 
they kind of nailed it. I thought it was really nice that first episode. I haven't watched all the. I don't. Don't tell me what happens to Dolly and <laughs> the wagon yet, because I don't know. Yet. So, but the first episode I thought was really great. I they kind of. I'll say I really enjoyed it up until like the last few episodes, because like mm-hmm. once you get to like the '70s and stuff, uh, my interest kind of mm-hmm. wanes. You know, um, once you get past like George Jones, I'm not so much interested. So. Um, but I, I really enjoyed it. I love the connections that he was able to draw, um, you know, with, you know, African-American music, with the, you know, the banjos and stuff, with the um, Hispanic influence in, in the music that's coming out of Texas, um, you know, and really showing that, you know, we like to think of country music as a very, like, white entertainment, but that the background really speaks to the American experience. You know, you've got German immigrants who are bringing like the polka beats that, that end up in a lot of, of yeah. country music. You've got, you know, people from, from all over, these Irish and English and Scottish ballad traditions that play into it, so. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, uh, you think about it, bluegrass band is, is a, it's five instruments, an upright bass, a guitar, a mandolin, fiddle and a banjo. Banjo is an African instrument. Mandolin and violin are Italian yeah. instruments. The guitar is a Spanish instrument. Yeah. Right, bass, I guess, would kind of go into, um, you know, in the violin family. Um, so it's really, I mean, it's really so multicultural and, and then I guess like so American um, in that way. So um, yeah, I, I think it was, I thought it was fascinating. You, there's no way to make a documentary that covers every single thing. You can't right. get every. There's somewhere in there. There's yeah. a, you're, or a bluegrass musician like, oh, I can't believe they left out this guy. I can't believe you can't make it. Can't be forever. So I thought it was pretty good. My big confession about that series is that I, um, I'm a, I, when there's something I know I'm going to care a lot about, I'm going to give it like a very special day. And my special day to watch this this year, I was proposing, was a big snowstorm. I wanted to be snowed in <laughs> with Ken Burns. Snowed in with <laughs> Ken Burns. <laughs> And I wanted to watch the whole thing, you know, like, like doing Godfather and skipping three. But um, I really wanted. And what happened? We didn't get a snowstorm. So I am still. Well, seen, there there is something outside that's keeping in your house. So it's yeah, good far. news. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, this is your opportunity in quarantine. I'm actually working. I work for an essential biz, essential business uh, at the Whole Ox as a butcher's assistant and all around utility man right now. So I'm actually. This is catching up on creative things right, right now. I usually would be asleep in about 20 minutes because I work from nine to six with like a 15 minute break. So um, I'm actually working more in quarantine time. So I, I wish there was a <laughs> idea of I'm writing great songs and seeing documentaries, but right now I'm slicing your bacon. So we appreciate, we appreciate the, the bacon. bacon. Yeah, yes. yeah, shout that out is to essential. Absolutely yeah. essential. <laughs> Do you have any more questions or comments? No, a lot of comments. Uh, a lot of people, I think, paying pretty intently to the music and enjoying that as well. Yeah. Good. I think, I think we just educated everyone. Yeah, really. where, where can people hear more of your music, guys? Let us know. Well, when this, is really virus... <laughs> when this virus is gone, I got all kinds of ideas. But right now, I am here at 22035 Pothouse Road, Middleburg. <laughs> If they drive up the driveway, I'll come yeah. outside. And drive I'll- up, demand <laughs> a song. Demand best. She might take half price hot dogs as payment given our discussion here. Absolutely. Well, we're meat farmers, so we're good. You're good <laughs> on that. Done that. Roll a large ball up and then she'll oh, yeah. bring right. a tin ball with you. Hard cider, you know. Yeah. Do a dance. Well, if people who are doing the live stream thing this Sunday. Um, our good friends at Dirt Farm Brewery, uh, where we would play in regular non-quarantine times, uh, like usually the third Friday of every month, um, to raise money for Bluemont Food Bank this Sunday. Um, we're going to be doing a live stream um, through our Crooked Angels Facebook page. Uh, if you, if anyone wants to look that up, um, all proceeds are going to go to a good cause. And uh, hopefully, weather permitting, it's going to be that glorious uh, backdrop of our beautiful um, Piedmont landscape and uh, a dirt farm is actually going to be donating a, a fair amount of their um, their beer sales that day um, to also help uh, the cause. So that's a that's a gig um, on the hor- on the horizon. So that's Sunday at five o'clock.
Awesome. It'll be on Facebook um, on our Crooked Angels uh, page or uh, friends with my, either my wife, Amy Potter, or me, Jamie Potter. It'll be on ours, I'm sure. So. Oh, yeah. And I, I have no, no, I had a couple shows coming up in May and they were all canceled. So I have no shows coming up. I play, I play with Bess. I play with random people. I'm kind of just sitting by the phone and waiting for people to call me. And I, <laughs> I ended up backing a lot of people. I would play mandolin and stuff too as a um, kind of accompany people. Um, I, am happy, I, I, play, I uh, am happy, Matt, that you started um, putting up some stuff on Instagram. It just makes my day to hear <laughs> you picking. So I actually Matt, that I, I met Matt. Um, he used to give lessons to my Guinevere, my oldest daughter, on mandolin. And um, I don't, I don't, I don't know why I. Um, didn't expect him to be as good as he was. But he, then, oh, and he would kind of, he'd kind of mindlessly be warming up while Guinevere was getting settled. And I'm hearing this incredible music coming from, you know, the front porch of the dining room or wherever they were. And I'm like trying to not interrupt, but I'm like right on the other side of the door, <laughs> just like listening just as happy as could be so anyways for a long time he didn't have an online presence but now he's on instagram you can hear him pick away at some stuff it's i actually totally started cool. doing that because you had asked me so do you have anything online and i'm like no uh do you have a facebook <laughs> no so i did end the up last mo getting, again yeah i had <laughs> instagram for a long time ago and i stopped actually using it because i was just like this is a waste of my time and so because of best i was like well maybe i'll start putting up videos again so I do put up a lot of videos of me playing tunes on um, on my Instagram, which is I think Matthew Metz twenty nine is my Instagram. Matthew yeah. Metz twenty nine, go look him up. Yeah, great. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm glad I, to know you do lessons because I I've been trying to learn claw hammer for like two weeks now. I've never played before in my life, and uh, so I might be contacting you. <laughs> <laughs> he taught me for a bit, and now I'm sad to say I've forgotten. <laughs> All of it. <laughs> Another success story. Yeah. It's it's a beer. Beer. It's my, my really <laughs> In regards to Instagram, I'd also say follow them, but follow Loudon Museum, follow Mosby Heritage Area, follow Historians on Tap. Uh, we've got virtual programs you know, with Mosby and Loudon Museum, uh, you know, multiple times a week. Uh, we've both got membership programs. We'd love it if you could follow us on all our platforms. Let us know. I mean, this whole program, I think, Emory came about because of an audience comment, right? Yes, yeah. actually, yeah. it was. Um, shout out if my auntie Monique is still watching in Putnam, Connecticut, because uh, we did a we did a program about um, about 1861 when it hit wonders, and she was very disappointed that there wasn't music, more music um, during the program, um, and of course. Bess had already become part of our lives in the Mosby Heritage area. And of course it was a natural fit. But so just for the record, we do take crowd requests if there's a topic that you guys wanna hear. Um, next week is going to be a fun one. Let me make sure that I don't get the wrong, get the wrong program here. Um, so next week is actually gonna be 1862. Too hot to handle is the theme for next week. So telling some lesser known stories about 1862, we'll be joined by Kevin Pollack from the Prince William Historic Resources Division. You can also join us, Mosby Heritage Area, tomorrow at five on Facebook for our Live at Five program with Jonathan Noyalis from, um, from Shenandoah U. And uh, is there anything from Loud Museum, Nikki? Yeah, after Live at Five, tune in with the Loud Museum or the George Tyler Moore Center. We're gonna be talking about Henry Clay 19th century and mint juleps at seven o'clock. Right. Nice. So that you've got a whole weekend lined up for you guys then. We join do. us on Facebook, look up our performers, go follow Matt on Instagram, you know. We do have more Instagram pretty too, big right? questions. I am. I am on Instagram too. So, and I wanted to say, I, I, because I don't have a rock and roll name, I am only ever billed as Blue Mountain Songbird. So that's how you find me on Facebook or on Instagram. I will say we have one more question uh, slash request from the crowd. It's in demand. So one of you three better step up. Uh, who can give us an encore and play us out? Anyone got a song they want to end this with? I think Bess is pretty much the lullaby anyone wants to hear to tonight. <laughs> so. Bess, can you play us out? Do you have a song you want to go sure. for uh, our encore? Sure. So this was the other one. Yeah. Uh, the other one from Patsy Klein that I was going to do. Thank you.
Strange. I gotta turn on my microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys.